Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our Tech Tuesday. And we've been covering the subject of IBS, which for those of you not familiar with it, is irritable bowel syndrome. And mm. if you've ever had it, you will know that if your bowel is irritated, so are you. <laughs> because it's not a fun thing. So we've covered a little bit about what it is and the different types. There's three different types of it and how it's diagnosed and how to look after it to a certain extent. And last week we ended off with um, covering over the diet. And I'm going to share my screen now and we'll kick in where we left off from the last time. Let's just lose all these goodies. And I've got a special guest tonight who's going to give a test to me just now. Um, so we're talking about IBS, what it is, what it isn't, and how to manage it. So last week we ended off on diet and what to do and what not to do over there. And this week we're going to start off with some activity changes because it's not just a single thing that heals this problem. Just like it's not just a single thing that causes the problem. We learned that stress is a big cause of irritable bowel syndrome, um, but it's not the main cause. It's just one of the causes. So changing daily activities can help you. And your medical doctor or um, dietitian may recommend that you exercise regularly. You aim for 150 minutes of moderate exercise weekly. Now, I'm not saying go to the gym and push weights for hour, an hour and a half a day. It's just go for a walk. Get outside in nature, get some fresh air, get some sunshine, just some basic exercises. Park further away from the entrance hall at the local mall and walk. So this works out at about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And moderate means you're raising your heart rate. We're not talking 160 beats a minute. We're talking if your resting heart rate is in the region of about, say, 60, <clears throat> raising it moderately would bring it up to probably around about 80, 90. Um, I know when I go out running, my heart rate gets up to about 110, 120, and then it calms down to around about between 50 and 60 again, which is fair when you're sitting and relaxing. And then you can try some relaxation techniques. So after you've done your exercise, go and relax. And this will include things like daily yoga, meditation, sitting praying, and other de-stressing de techniques that can help calm and overtax nervous system and a nervous gut. Sometimes a behavioral therapist can help. To be honest, I don't know any behavioral therapists down here. Um, possibly your uh, psychologists would be able to help with that, but somebody that can help you to de-stress. So probably your best therapist would be your best friend. And go down, if you are fortunate like us, we said that we, we live down the coast. So go for a walk on the beach that raises your heart rate. Then go and sit down, whether it's on the beach, on a bench, and watch the sea. If you've ever taken the time to actually just sit and watch the waves, it is an extremely calming thing. Um, you'll see in some doctor's offices that they've got fish tanks because it's been shown as well that watching fish swimming in a tank is also extremely therapeutic and relaxing. Just because you're watching this activity and it calms you down, takes your mind off things. So even if the sea is a little bit rough, it's still calming. And you can get various apps and things and you have this white noise that plays in your ear at night. I'm very fortunate in that I don't need to have any apps or anything like that because I can hear the sea. And that sound, even though the waves are sometimes quite heavy and it feels like they or sounds like they're breaking in my front yard um, near a kilometer away, still very relaxing. So I'm very fortunate in that almost every night, you know, some nights you don't always hear it that clearly, but almost every night I get to go to sleep 
with the sound of the sea roaring in the background, which is a very relaxing white noise. And then that's the other thing. You need to get enough sleep. And you need to aim for seven to nine hours of quality sleep each night. Not getting up or <laughs> often jokingly say, if you've ever heard the terminology sleeping like a baby, uh, the alternative definition to that is waking up every two hours crying. Because I think sometimes that's what it feels like when you've got a new baby. But you need to get good quality sleep. Go to bed at the same time each night. And a good night's rest is one of the most powerful de-stresses available. Reach out to a provider if you're having trouble sleeping. And I know there are people, there are sleep therapists out there. Again, I don't know of anybody local. There might be some up in Durban. But sleep therapists will watch you, monitor you, and see how are you sleeping. Are you getting into that deep, relaxing sleep? Or are you just light sleeping where the smallest little noise or light that comes on anywhere will wake you up? That's not good restful sleep. Just like you, like I said last week, we need to keep a food diary, keep an activity diary, record the activities that help you manage your IBS and compare notes with your provider. So it doesn't have to be anything major, just little things in a little booklet. Went for a walk for 10 minutes today. Broke a small bit of perspiration on my brow when I went for, for my walk. I was slightly out of breath when I went around the block. Managed to walk for 20 minutes today before falling out of breath. Sat and watched the sea for 10 minutes. Those little things, you don't always see what's happening. But when you keep a journal, you can look back and you can see your progress. And I often tell my patients the same thing. You know, today you're lying in bed you, because you've just had surgery and you don't think you're making any progress. Because the physio was there and you did a little bit of exercise and just sitting up in bed was felt as though you'd done 400 sit-ups. And tomorrow they come along and they bully you and they throw you out of bed and you stand and you stood and you maybe shuffle forward one step and you shuffle backwards one step and it feels like you've run half the Comrades Marathon. But the next day you get out of bed easier and you walk around the bed. I call it jogging around the block. The day before, you could barely take one step. Now you've walked around the block, but you forget about those things. Day three, they take you for a jog around the whole unit, but you've forgotten that two days ago, you could barely lift your head. So just watching those activities, making a little diary, and you look back and you go, oh, okay, you know, Two days, I, two days ago, I could barely sit up. Now I've walked for 10 minutes around the ward. You're making progress. And the same with the activities. And that's why I like my park run is because when I did my first park run, I think my time was in the region of like about 40 odd minutes. And I walked significantly more than I ran. And what they do is you get a little barcode and they scan you at the end of each week, at the end of each run. And then they send you an email and you can keep track of your time. Well, now I can do the same distance in under 30 minutes. What used to take me 45 minutes now takes me less than 30 minutes. I've made progress. But it hasn't been overnight. It's taken me a good few years to get there. And I still feel like I've got a good little while to go yet because I'm competing with a nearly 80-year-old who's doing this in 25 minutes, and he's already run a 15K warm-up before he gets there. So there's progress that can be made, but you don't know that until you look at your activities in your diary. So other treatments include things like therapy, counseling. Talk to somebody. You don't have to go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist <laughs> or a counselor. Go and find a friend. Go and have a chat. Go and sit down. Maybe not have a cup of coffee because that's not always good for your IBS, but go and say, listen, come for a walk with me at the beach or let's go to the beach and sit down and, and talk. And you just sit down over a juice or a glass of water or something and you talk. Just that talking is often 
good therapy because you're getting the stress off of your mind. And medications, that's the last ditch effort. If nothing else has worked, then you go to the medications because no disrespect to anybody, but medications have got side effects and everybody is affected differently. So you don't want to get hooked too much on it. Medications definitely have their uses. I'm not pushing them down. I'm not saying you never use them. They have their uses, but try not to get too used to them. So now we need to look at your diet and what you can eat and also what you can't eat. So individuals with IBS can use nutrition and lifestyle strategies to help control and manage their gut symptoms and improve their quality of life and optimize their digestive health. Because remember, IBS is your gut that's going into spasm and just like a cramp in your calf, it goes into spasm and it, you battle to get rid of that spasm. But how do you do that? You work it with your diet. Because remember, as I said the other day or last week, that certain foods can trigger the IBS. So it's common for people with IBS to experience gut symptoms after eating certain kinds of foods. And what may trigger symptoms in one person may not trigger symptoms in someone else. And as I suggested last week, keep a food diary to check and see exactly how and what is triggering your symptoms. And there are general strategies that can help everyone with IBS. And yet what works best for you will require an individualized approach because as always, nothing is set in concrete because what works for me probably won't work for you and vice versa. And food is a powerful tool to have in your toolbox and a registered dietitian can help guide and support you in creating a long-term strategy and plan that works for you and your lifestyle. <clears throat> and this could include helping to foster a positive relationship with food, increasing confidence when making food choices at home and when eating out, encouraging nourishing foods that won't worsen your gut symptoms because by keeping your diary, you can see what your triggers are, preventing unnecessary food restrictions and managing potential food fears where you go, you see all this spread of food and you, oh, I'd really like to, but I don't want to touch that because it's going to trigger me. Or I'd really like to. And you get to the stage where you actually don't want to go out because you're scared of what you might be encouraged to eat. And you know that those things could be triggers. And people who don't have these problems, people who don't have food allergies or food intolerances, don't understand that not everybody can eat everything. And it can be quite stressful, which can obviously then lead to more problems. So there are 15 nutritional lifestyle strategies that you can use. First is enjoy meals at regular times. Chew it well and eat slowly. Don't be in a hurry. You may find it easier to digest and tolerate smaller portions of food versus larger portions. There's no reason why you can't have five meals a day, as long as they're small. Drink at least eight cups or two liters of fluid per day. Things like water, herbal tea, broth, etc., to stay hydrated, because that is a key feature. Try a short-term low FODMAP diet to help identify special or specific food triggers. Now, FODMAPs are a group of specific carbohydrates that might trigger gut symptoms. High FODMAP foods include things like apples, onion, garlic, wheat, lactose, and sugar alcohols. Space fruit intake apart by two to three hours and stick to no more than one fruit portion per meal or snack because it can cause a buildup of sugar in your system. Choose cooked vegetables more often than raw, as cooked vegetables are easier to digest. And when we say cooked, I would suggest steaming as opposed to boiling, because that way you can retain more of the nutrition in your vegetables. Choose easier to digest proteins, such as eggs, chicken, turkey, fish, extra firm tofu, and plain lactose-free Greek yogurt. 
Lower fat cooking methods such as baking, roasting, steaming, boiling, and sauteing can also help you avoid uncomfortable symptoms. So stick, stay away from the fast foods, your junk foods, your fried foods. Consider adding in certain types of fiber if you're constipated, such as flax seeds, oats, inulin, or psyllium. Avoid wheat bran and prunes, which are highly fermentable fibers that can trigger symptoms such as gas and abdominal pain. Remember, you get different types of fiber. You get soluble, insoluble, lignans, pectins. And there's actually a whole mess of the different types of fibers. So try and spread them out. Don't just stick to one particular thing. You need to limit your gas-producing vegetables and legumes, such as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, chickpeas, lentils, and black beans, if they trigger symptoms for you. And you will know this from your food diary. You need to limit coffee and strong caffeinated teas, like black and green tea, to no more than three cups per day. So we're not saying don't ever drink coffee or tea again. Just limit it. Reduce the, the amount. You need to limit your alcohol, your carbonated drinks, spicy foods, and deep fried or greasy foods, such as French fries, pizza, hamburgers, tempura, yeah, all those nice things. And we are saying limit, not necessarily exclude altogether. Limit your sugar alcohols and artificial sweeteners, such as sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol, maltitol, and erythritol, especially if you are experiencing diarrhea. Some foods naturally contain these, such as prunes, cauliflower, and mushrooms, except for oyster mushrooms, as well as sugar-free candies and gums. Um, I've got a, a range of sugar-free mints that I, that I really enjoy. And their sweetener, they're very sweet, but there's no sugar in them. Their sweetener is mannitol. And they've actually got a warning on there that if you have too many, you're going to get diarrhea. So, oh, great. Consider a short-term trial of a daily probiotic for at least one month and monitor your symptoms. Ask your doctor, pharmacist, or registered dietitian if there are any reasons why you shouldn't be taking a probiotic. For instance, you might be immunocompromised. Um, you might be taking a, an antibiotic, in which case you don't want to take a probiotic until after you've finished your antibiotic course. Rule out gluten intolerance and celiac disease. And I would suggest you letting your doctor rule that out for you. It is possible for people to experience an intolerance to the carbohydrates in wheat. This is the FODMAP part. Instead of the protein in wheat, which is your gluten, which may be one reason why many people with suspected gluten intolerance tolerate 100% sourdough wheat bread, which is a low FODMAP food, but not regular wheat bread which is a high FODMAP food. Enjoy your regular physical activity. This can help to reduce gas, bloating, stress, and anxiety, all of which can trigger gut symptoms. Talk to your doctor and or physiotherapist about which level of physical activity is right for you. And in this case, I would suggest actually speaking to your physio before you talk to your doctor, because the doctor knows the medical side, not always the activity side. And you need to manage your stress and anxiety. The brain-gut connection is very strong and well-researched. We've spoken before about it, that your gut is often called your second brain. And you may notice worsened gut symptoms during times of increased stress and anxiety, which is a common response. And strategies to reduce stress could include walking in nature, listening to calm music, taking a nap, cooking, meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, writing, reading, massages, therapy, or anything else that you find helps you to relax. Horse riding is something that, that I find relaxes me, but other people get very stressed about it. Some people may also want to seek out counseling from a professional and explore psychological therapies such as biofeedback, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, and gut-directed hypnotherapy. And just some very brief 
um, cover on supplements because I still want to get Teresa to fill us in on her story. Vitamin B complex. The B vitamins are manufactured in the small intestine and are often lost during diarrhea. The B vitamins are particularly important for IBS sufferers who often suffer from depression as they help brain function. And many people with IBS are deficient in iron, which vitamin B12 helps the body to absorb. Fiber. It is recommended that you use a multi-fiber blend as there are different types of fiber with different properties. Vitamin E, this unique antioxidant contains a lubricating oil, which is thought to prevent constipation and has a soothing and calming effect on the bowel, helping to reduce inflammation. Fish oil, there are more than 3000 scientific studies that now show that omega-3 fish oils have an anti-inflammatory effect on the body and are therefore thought to help reduce inflammation in the bowel. And in my opinion, omega-3 is one of the best natural anti-inflammatories that you can get, not just for the bowel, but for a lot of other issues. Magnesium. And figures show that due to our hectic lifestyles and poor eating habits, many of us are lacking in magnesium, which is an important mineral which helps our bodies to absorb calcium and potassium. Many scientists also believe it acts as a calming agent on the bowel and can have a laxative effect because calcium causes contraction and magnesium causes relaxation. And zinc, preferably in a chelated form, almost half the UK population is deficient in this mineral, which is excellent for the immune system, which is compromised in many IBS sufferers. And there is one other thing that I haven't added on to this, mostly because of space, but our aloe vera juice that we had a session on the other day with our um, dietitian, Connie, who explained how well the aloe juice works, and it works really well for IBS, because that is the end of my show here, and this is where our special guest, Teresa, is going to come in, because she's going to tell us her story and her experience with our aloe vera juice. T, go ahead. Thank you for inviting me to share, Sean. I appreciate it. So um, I've been battling with IBS for more than 10 years now. And if those of you who have IBS will know that you are often bloated. Um, you battle with indigestion. And when you have these flare-ups after eating something that you shouldn't have eaten, it's a crippling pain. Um, I've tried over the years lots of different um, herbal treatments um, but what I found what triggers it is spicy food and for me that's it's, it's very sad I'm, I'm Indian as you can see I grew up eating spicy food and all of a sudden I'm told that listen you need to stop eating spicy food you've got to stop drinking that much coffee and drink your three liters of water whatever the case may be so I went on to all bran flakes. I did the flax seeds. Um, I even bought little high fiber sachets that clicks and I introduced it to my diet. And yes, I did have prunes, three prunes a day. I did apple cider vinegar with turmeric and honey in my water. And I did exercise. So I've been managing it. But every now and again, because you're managing it so well, you think, hey, you know, I'm doing good. <laughs> Let's just try this. This, um, this roti, <laughs> it's got gluten, it's full of gluten. And that's obviously a trigger. And I had a flare up and I was in so much of pain. I said to Sean, listen, this is a story. I I've tried everything. I'm on the probiotics. I honestly, I don't know what to do. So he recommended the aloe vera juice. I used the aloe juice um, for about three days. I did 50 mils before a meal and then after a meal. Now, usually when I have a flare up, it lasts for at least 10 days until my digestive system starts working better again, where I don't have that indigestion going on. So I, I used the aloe juice for three days and I still had the pain. On the fourth day, it was I was cured. The pain had gone away. Um, I digested properly. I wasn't walking around with this spasm. Um, if you guys know of spastic colon, you'd know that that pain is horrible. 
and I was sleeping better. I had more energy, and I, I yeah, I just think it's a it's a magical juice, but it's it's aloe vera. So, if you guys have IBS or know of somebody who has IBS, please let them know about the aloe vera juice. It works. It 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 helped me, and um, I will continue using it. So thank you, Sean. It's oh, a pleasure. Well well thank you. Thanks for filling us in on that. So yeah, and it's the well aloe done. not only is a it's a soother, and if anybody's ever had bad sunburn and you put or any burn for that matter and you put aloe vera gel on it, it works amazingly well almost instantly to take that burn out. So with your gut, it would be a similar sort of thing. Um, it would be inflammation, which is it's it's burning basically, and there's a lot of extra production of acid, etc. So the aloe automatically soothes that. And then obviously with the chamomile, that makes a huge difference just to calm and relax. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously for when you need it during the day, the ginseng kicks in for the energy. So. <laughs> yes, it definitely does. <laughs> well done to you, Lisa. Right. Oh, does thank anybody you. Else I'm just so pleased that it worked. It, it, <laughs> it worked. And um, you, you guys, the pain that you have after a day up, it's... It's excruciating. I was up that Sunday night. I, 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 I did not sleep. I was at work and Monday was like, Sean, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yes, yeah. it, it definitely helps. It worked. Yeah. It worked. Does anybody the else have any comments or questions? Product. Sorry, Norma. I said the most amazing product. It is absolutely yes. fabulous. I have it a is. bottle of it in my fridge always, always, always. Even although I don't have IBS or anything critical, <laughs> if I do something, maybe that's call, why you don't have the IBS because you have a <laughs> bottle in your fridge all the time. Well, that's right. And but if I get indigestion, if I've eaten something wrong or you know something that's unusual, boy, out comes that bottle of aloe vera. <laughs> and I, and I even, I've, as you know, most of you know, I've even given it to my dogs and my cat before. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Yeah. Um, it's for anybody and everybody. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Any other comments or questions before I stop the recording? I just well, want to I've say... now put it on to uh, my teenage son. He's in matric this year, and he's also drinking a little bit of it to help him um, get through those long nights. Good. Go on, see. I just wanted to say it just shows you that one have to know what is the right and what is the wrong food for you. Um, Teresa, I think you will agree with me. To have a cheat, it's nice, but the consequences it's not, it. worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it at the end of the day. Well no, done, huh? no, it's not worth okay. it. We're not going to have cake anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Small samples here and there is okay. <laughs> just keep the LA no. handy. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Okay, I'm going to end the recording.